Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for an understated TT. We didn't get the Planche de Belfi uh, experience like we did last year, but we weren't expecting it either. He was Benji as usual on the Saturday before Champs at least saying for stage 20. The show is supported by Lacole, who produced performance cycling apparel. Uh, you know how we do TT straight into the results. Wild Van Aert underperformed a little bit, I think. Got coming after Jonas in the first TT today, he absolutely smoked it, winning this TT with a time of 35.53, a quicker average speed for everybody, 51.5K is now quicker than the first TT. A little, he said it better suited him. Asgren second, uh, how many seconds? 21 seconds behind Van Aert. Then Jonas Wingergold third, backing up his stage five TT performance. Then Kuhn, Bissiger, Catania, Bia. Bagacha, Court, Alaphilippe, Van Bala rounding up the top 10. Oh, McNulty might be 11th. Uh, so big gaps from Van Aert to, I think, 12th or 13th is about two minutes. So really solid performance from him. And uh, do you think seeing this performance from Van Aert, Benji, that it's accurate to say he was a little bit undercooked for no, for no one's fault in uh, maybe the first five stages of this year's tour? I think so. I think we um we kind of discussed that at the start as well, that he had a surgery like a month before the Tour de France started, even closer than a month, the appendicitis thingy, and that obviously had its consequences. It didn't give him the perfect preparation, and therefore he wasn't at its optimal form there. And it looks like throughout the Tour de France, he was growing gradually towards the end of the Tour, and most importantly, I think for him, the Tokyo Olympics that are coming up in like a week, crazy, but yeah, it's coming. And it turns out that on the Ventoux, he was already pretty damn strong in week two but today he basically destroyed everybody and it w- it didn't really feel close even like at the start of the time trial we had good times like and i was getting doing a good time and destroying the people that were already having results but then van art came and it was like okay first time he's significantly under the time of asgren so at this point i'm thinking van art is a kind of time trialist that tends to keep that same level for a long time trial and doesn't exactly break down in the third part stuff like that so i thought he had it the second he uh rode under the uh first time check personally you yeah he seems to have paced he didn't fade badly on the stage one tt he was behind i thought like not yeah. doing great it's a t1 so let me just looking at the intermediate splits today he was first 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 in all the intermediates except the second to the finish he gave a little bit back to uh, well, Alaphilippe did the quickest second to the finish. He did an 11.36, 13 seconds quicker than Van Aert, and he came 10. Wow. So maybe Alaphilippe went out too easy. Uh, so he, I almost feel like Alaphilippe did a much, he did a much better TT today, I think, than his stage five TT, where we yep. low-key thought he might come top five. Other notable performances, I guess, are four Danish riders in the top 10, Asgren, Wingergaard, Kort, and uh, who else? Bia. Yeah. Mikhail Bia, he's won three under twenty three world championships, but he just he's always outside the top three regularly of these Grand Tour stages. Um, but yeah, Danish G team is on fire, and the other big news, of course, is Ben O'Connor. The big GC battle we thought <laughs> might happen would be O'Connor, like thirty two seconds before the stage ahead of Kelderman. Kelderman on paper a better time trialist. O'Connor maybe not of you know, practiced it enough or had the investment from the team in his TT before this Tour de France. And uh, the quokka roared, Ben O'Connor. <laughs> ben O'Connor, let's go, baby. Held's fourth at the Tour from Perth. What was that? Get the fuck out of here, Kelderman. Ben O'Connor, can't believe it. I'm so happy uh, for O'Connor. Now, he did it a weird way. In the, he lost like four minutes in the first few stages. And then how many minutes did he actually make back, Benji, on the other team? He made back on Kelderman on stage nine. Guess how many minutes? Six. 6.50. <laughs> Six minutes 50 because no one chased that breakaway with O'Connor in it. Movistar didn't chase it. EF helped him uh, and Bora didn't chase it at all. And you just needed to chase a little bit. And, uh, yeah, so that was interesting. Maybe yeah, and he, he like, started the time trial as well, saying, like, fourth or fifth, I don't really care. It's, like, it's top five. <laughs> he didn't really <laughs> care about fourth and fifth. And I cared I more than he that, did. <laughs> yeah, it pro- that's probably true. But I think that the pressure of that, feeling that it's top five anyway, probably 
gives him less of like the oh pressurized feeling i have to yeah, go for it's fourth not now podium, it's, is it? yeah exactly so it's that that healthy pressure that is not demoralizing or demotivating among the park or if you're not actually making it during the first intermediates but at the first intermediate already he was getting better results than Kelderman. Kelderman who did crash twice this Tour de France that's also important but so did 90% of the peloton yeah. so yeah it always depends on how hard you crash and so forth but I do want to come back one second towards the uh the Danish masterpieces in that top 10. I think I discussed this a tiny bit last time but I want to add more to it. Let's say you've got a team time trial with national teams. Would you go for Denmark or Italy? Denmark being Asgren, Vingega, Biel, Kortz, Mats Wertschmidt, or those kind of riders versus Agana, Affini, uh, Cataneo, and Betiol and so forth? Who have Slovenia you got? Pogacar, Roglic, Tratnik, Žiga Horvat. Uh... Yeah, I'd have to think about it. Australia got Dennis, Durbridge, Sweeney, Port, O'Connor. Nah, yeah, I think Denmark's pretty good. Belgium, who have you got? I have to, that's something. That's an off-season one. Someone write like that down. We like four for something. <laughs> Sturvin <laughs> and Greg Van Avermaet would attack each other in TT. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we're getting out of control here. There's not much too, too much happening in this stage. Uh, I just want to say, I, I know I was being mean to Kelderman. He actually had a great tour, to be honest. He had... One, two, three, four, five stages. He's in the top ten. Two top fives in stages one and two. Very nice. He's, as Benji said, crashed a couple of times. He's second or third in the Giro last year. He's now fifth at Tour de France. And, yeah, he just with not much teammate help at all, really. I mean, I'm sure they were helping him a little bit. Buchmann did help him on Luzard at Den. But generally, he's he and Sagan went to the Tour de France and allowed the other teammates to, to be the teammates that were selected were not there to help them. And Kelman did his own thing. Sagan crashed out. Pullet and Conrad and Schelling were all able to do their own things. And so they got fifth at the tour plus a couple of stage wins. Uh, so, yeah, really good from Kelderman. So good on him. And I'll be interested to see what the rest of his season looks like. He's doing the road race afterwards. But O'Connor Benji, it, it doesn't actually change my opinion too much on it. You've got to remember for this, I, I'll read out the final GC standings just to remind people. Pogaccia wins GC, 5.20 ahead of Giannis, then seven minutes ahead of Carapaz, 10 minutes to fourth, O'Connor, then Kelderman, Maas, Lutschenko, Pierre Martin, Peo Bilbao, Uran round up the top 10, Uran at 18 minutes. Remember that Roglic was favourite for the Tour, narrowly on Betfair just before it started, crashed out. Thomas crashes and don't know what else happened to him. Port, uh, don't know what's happened to him, sick maybe. So there's... Three of the top four favourites for this Tour de France out. Oh, no, sorry, Carapaz was fourth favourite. Three of the top five. And so I think this top ten looks very different, Benji, with uh, with Roglic here. And maybe O'Connor wouldn't have been allowed that licence to get eight minutes up the road on Tini. I think that's the stage Jumbo would have targeted. But, yeah, my question to you is, and it was asked on the commentary, if you're as you deserve Citroën, do you now invest everything into O'Connor GC for like the Tour or Giro next year? No, I think that he does deserve a support and he does deserve a role where he's in the leadership. We've seen that from, was it Romany or Swiss, one of those uh, Swiss races already Romany. where he was doing really well the, the stage that Thomas crashed in the last kilometer yeah. and O'Connor has the ability to ride on the mountains properly. It feels like he's better at the mountainous, steady mountainous sparkle then they're really steep pinches. Correct me if I'm wrong. And when it comes to time trial, he's not actually horrendous. It, it's not great. Like, let's be real. His time trial today is not amazing either. Nah, but just it's because Calderman underperformed today. But I'd still say that it's manageable. So it is valuable to get top 10s and grand tours, top 5s, if he is lucky, in the sense that Giro. If he loses time in the first week and then comes back in the second week on Tinia, six minutes and 50 seconds, well, that's a slight bit of luck that you have that leash to get freed on the first week, you know? It was the lack of control in week one that allowed breakaways on stage seven, eight, and nine to get so easily, like, the free gift of the stage because UAE wasn't sure of themselves yet. They weren't confident yet in, can we actually control this stage? And as a consequence, they're letting breakaways go. And O'Connor was one of the riders in there. It could just as well have been 
I don't know, Pare Pantre or Mankeys or Godu, stuff like that. But I think that O'Connor proved afterwards that he was deserving of that spot, that he was deserving of being a GC competitor here. We were talking about it directly after Tinier. Can he actually manage it? Podium, we deemed not really doable, but we did say he can keep top 10 and it's it's better than that. It's top five. And yeah. I think you even said that it could have been top five if he really went for it. So awesome stuff. Ben O'Connor, really well done. And it kind of sparks the interest of like these these budget GC riders. I think you mentioned it before we started recording today. Magic Ateneo, he's been riding very well in time trials. Like genuinely, I think he was top 10 was both five? GCs. Oh, it was an eighth. Okay. A bit worse than I expected, than I remembered, but still a very strong TT, eighth and sixth in those TTs. And he has the skills to do well on those steady climbs once again, not necessarily the spiky ones. And as a consequence, he is just out of top 10 here. And I wonder where he lost the time. Honestly, was it in Pontivy stage, 72nd? He did lose quite a lot of time there. One minute 21 more, one minute 56 plus. Yeah, I think it's one minute that he lost there. So yeah. that's that's not that's not amazing, but it's also not really moving the needle when it comes to the position he has in GC too much, considering the gaps are significantly larger than that. But he, he was doing lead out. He, uh... he was doing lead out duties. Yep. Catania. He was also, I think, they were helping Alaphilippe GC stand position in the yep. first seven stages too, at least until the first TT. So it's not like he had a just ride 100% for yourself the whole time either. I think I want to compare – oh, maybe we'll save it for, for afterwards, Benji. It's just interesting to me to see, you know, Enric Maas, he forgot to do his skin suit up, but they had the expensive chain put on for the TT. He does finish in sixth, fifth last year, sixth this year, still consistent top ten, but it's just different seeing the approaches of, say, education first. Guys can go for stages. Jumbo Visma, Robert's crashed out. Guys can go for stages. Ineos – it didn't really free their guys. Azuzer and and Bora, they let their guys go for the, for stages, but Movistar didn't too much. So maybe a little yeah, bit twice. in the third week. Yeah, and Valverde, and that's it, I think. Yeah, nothing in the first. Whereas EF always, always let their guys go for it because you you never know what can happen in, in the. Well, you know. they also ended on tenth, so it didn't really end yeah, too but, perfectly. But, but Uran was second for two weeks. Team. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. He just collapsed in the final week, and I think that is not necessarily i don't know i don't know what to say about it it feels like uran got secured a bit in the first two weeks this is a theory that you launched already at the start of week two that you felt like these first two weeks protect certain riders and protect certain riders because there's no mountain finishers does they can actually come back in the descent or they can try and follow as much as possible until the descent and then they're done for for uh potentially losing more time and so forth but on a mountain finish it's not like that and in all honesty, Pogacar opened up every third week mountain stage earlier than we've seen in the last how many years? Five <laughs> years in cycling yeah. with eight k to go on climbs, with with five k to go on climbs. Usually they'd wait until the last kilometer and a half these days, but that was amazing to see. And I think that I also kind of want to discuss Pogacar's time trial because some yeah. people might go ahead and say like, "Oh, horrendous time trial today. He's so bad at time trialing." Like genuinely, oh, hey, <laughs> that's horrendous. But I think that. There's more to it. I think that he probably had his DS say to him before the stage starts, you've got the yellow jersey, mate. Play it safe. This is the only thing that is keeping you from your yellow jersey. It's finishing safely in Paris. And therefore, his cornering must have been slower than what yeah, what a normal Pogaccio would be doing and so forth. It was, it was noticeable in the corners. Like you did mention during the stage that his cornering was a bit off, right? Yeah, it just is almost like when he was he was thinking so much about not crashing, he would then take a weird line and then almost crash. Um, and he, like he nearly clipped a barrier, I think, after the second intermediate. He went really close to it. I was like, ooh. But he wasn't going quick and then he was getting the water bottle out. He's drinking it. He wasn't caring too much about time. And listen, you're five minutes or whatever, six minutes ahead. How are you going to motivate yourself with already winning three stages to go absolutely maximum physically? It's impossible, right? Uh, but he still looked pretty cooked after the TT. He looked quite tired. And maybe he was a little bit hot today as well. I know Van Aert said, he's like, when I got into the hot seat, it literally was the hot seat. I was on fire because <laughs> I was so hot after the effort. Kuhn seemed to pace a little bit too hard. And I want to talk about him now, Benji. 
me, me and you, I like Kung. I like Stefan Kung, but he faded. Uh, so he was second at the at T1, thir- uh, third at T2. From first, t- from T1 to T2, he was eighth. And then from T2 to finish, he was sixth. So obviously, uh, I think Kirby called it a banana split, which is kind of funny, I got to say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, obviously, maybe the weather played into it. I rolled my it. eyes hearing that, hearing that <laughs> sentence. I thought it was funny. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Van Aert was, uh, Van Aert seemed to go a little bit at the end, and I think O'Connor went out really hard, um, and Kelderman was consistent. But yeah, there's not much else to really say apart from Bill Bow. Well, he, he had issues with the radio. Any other things you want to pick out from this? I think that Stefan King's problem was mainly the second time check. It's literally called mountain, so obviously it has some mental, like influence on him. He thinks it's an actual mountain, and afterwards he exploded, but. Like, I find it a bit of a joke that the time check is called Mountain Man. It's a hill of, like, 80 meters above sea level. But uh, all in all, Stefan King's time trial, he feels like he's a god at prologues. Like, genuinely, when it's a prologue, he's one of the top riders in there. When it comes to longer time trials, I always had something with King that he was good at them, but he was never really the best rider on the road, and except for, like, a few occasions. And I feel like... This Tour de France shows it as well. There's always one or two riders that are better than him on a parkour. Yes, it's still a relatively hilly parkour, but it's not the hilliest of them all. And on paper, it should fit him. Ah, I think that he's likely going to be disappointed after this. And he seems to be very disappointed every time after a time trial that isn't first place, which is always sad to see. But yeah, that's part of the sport, not winning. And I think that Stefan Kung is probably going to... Uh, win some more stuff in his life but he always hits one better rider and now it's three better riders today with Jonas Vingegaard once again with a really strong time trial one other day <laughs> crazy stuff the guy's like 59 kilos right 58 kilos yeah and I just he, he gained 12 seconds on Pagacha across the last 12 stages of this year's Tour de France which is interesting to think about that's again some TDF recap discussions and that's with Bonus seconds of Pogacar exactly. every stage. So it's all on the road he's taken that, or on the TT really. And that's not including the 38 seconds at the top of on two because it was a descent finish. So, yeah, just interesting to think about him going forward. I think, yeah, I, I think that's really something for me and Benji to think about as well for how you distribute Foss, Fingergaard and Roglic and Van Aert across stage races next year uh, in the Umber Visma squad. Some a difficult but good just good just difficult decisions for them to make uh but otherwise podcast. <laughs> tomorrow champs elysee benji we said as a meme it would be greipel v cavendish greipel announced today he'd be retiring at the end of this year not at the end of the tdf at the end of this year i think he announced it today because he didn't want it to be overtaken by the furor tomorrow um we said that as a meme but it's actually our memes are not dreams they're real now it could actually be Greibel v. Cav tomorrow plus Van Aert and 108k Champs Elysees procession. Um, tell me why a breakaway can't win this stage, Benji. The reason that I don't think a breakaway will win this stage is because the Koenig will go 100% for Cavendish on this stage. I don't believe that somebody in that team will dare to put their hands in the air and say, What if we attack with Asgreen on that little hill in the tunnel with? 1.x amount of kilometers to go I, I don't think anyone will dare to propose that in the team because they want well obviously the hype in the media is real that 35th victory beating the Mercs record it's a thing and I don't think well Cavendish doesn't talk about it but the fact that he's saying don't mention a name don't mention a name that means that he's thinking about it <laughs> in my eyes at least and as a consequence I think that he's going to try and go for it and I think the Koenig will try and control that and they're going to try and set up the perfect lead out for that. I do remember that quite a few times already they did try a late attack on the Champs-Élysées. But what I find most intriguing here is that they actually changed the finish of the Champs-Élysées compared to last oh, year. Really? It is 300 meters later. So it's now 700 meters past that corner, that chicane, instead of 400 meters. The Renshaw corner. Yeah, and the reason is that there's some new surfacing And as a consequence, it's less, well, it's still a relatively safe corner, but it's not as safe as before. So they put the finish line later. They thought about safety in a sprint. Can you imagine it? Like 
that's next level UCI thinking. I, I'm i surprised, mind blown that they did that, but it's a good thing. And I think that it might make the race different as in the final sprint because you don't have that opportunity of like stretching it out in that chicane. You have to still stretch it out after the chicane, right? Because like it changes the lead up, right? Yeah. How do you train a Tour de France, Champs-Élysées sprint train? Like, it's not like you can go on location and say... It's like a crit, right? Just hire, like, rent an airport and, like, put cones <laughs> just like, like yeah. a chicane. <laughs> or just a driving school clinic or something. And, yeah, put the cones out. I don't know. <laughs> but Van Aert says he's going to be contesting it. I just want to mention, before we pick our... Our favourites for tomorrow, who we think will win the sprint. Mention our show partner, LaCole. There's a few days left to use our discount code LRTDF20 to get 20% off at checkout, even on already discounted items. There's the McLaren Project Aero collaboration, as well as the lightweight collection they brought out before the start of the Tour de France. So they support the podcast since its inception. So if you want to support the podcast as well, you can check out LaCole through the description below. But Benji... Who's your pick tomorrow? Is Cam breaking the record? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that Wild Fanart's winning tomorrow. <laughs> I think so too. I wonder what the odds will be. You think Cavendish will be the favourite? I'm guessing so, but I don't think Wild Fanart is going to be too far off. Like I mentioned the change in finish, and I think that that might reduce the strength of a lead out a bit because it's further away from the chicane. So Sorry, longer straight. to that chicane. Yeah, okay. longest right. So it's Van Aert. You've got more time to move up still afterwards. That's why. That's at least how I see it. And therefore, I think that I dare to say Wout Van Aert because that lead out will still be amazing on paper from the Koenig. But I do, uh, I do believe that Wout Van Aert will be beating Cavendish tomorrow. But I'd be down for uh, Cavendish to take it as well. But then again, like I know you want Wout for well, you said Van Aert as well. I know you said that, but. I think that I'm going to have to like switch it and go for Gripel just for like completely biased territories here. Can Philipson, Philipson can obviously win if he gets it right. If you're honest, Rickard, I think the way for them to win is Rickard needs to bring him up. He can't just be on Cavendish wheel. He's never shown he's quick enough to beat Cavendish from behind him, right? Or maybe he did at Turkey. I didn't watch closely enough. But um, I think Rickard needs to do to bring Philipson up. And that can make the difference and move him, move him in front of Cavendish. But that is easier said than done against this quick step train. Um, otherwise, the sprint field is really, really shallow. Like the other people we're looking at are Matthews, Laporte. Is that it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, who else? Greifel. Yeah, it's definitely not top level. Danny Van Poppel. <laughs> Those Grilly. are the kind of riders you're going towards then. Um, but yeah, I think. I think on paper, my my mind says uh, Van Aert here, but my heart says Greipel, knowing that he just announced his retiree and so forth. That uh, is how I see it. Mats Pedersen, he came second last year in this stage. He's not shown anything looking like form since then, so it's hard to go with him for a good result. But I guess, you know, you never know. It's a different sort of stage, easier stage procession-wise. Yeah, I think Van Aert is a good good, good call. But whatever happens, there'll be scenes on Champs-Élysées. Whether Cavendish retires afterwards will be interesting as well. Lefebvre kind of in the media said, oh, yeah, I think it's a great time for Cap to retire. I was like, is that because you can't afford him now because he's good again? <laughs> <laughs> so you want him to retire? Um, but, yeah, Pogaccio obviously will have that the yellow jersey procession. And you did some calculations, Benji. How quickly do they need to get on the plane or to get to the airport, to get to Tokyo? Oh, yeah. Uh, it depends on the it depends on the person. Uh, I heard somewhere that it was three hours for certain um, teams to go on the airplane just after the stage. But apparently, Pogacar is flying over on Monday, so okay. for him that's not the case. The thing about Pogacar is, I I read this quote on Twitter, so it is not a confirmed source, but I found it so funny. Apparently, Pogacar said about it. I, I was checking on Google Maps where I, whether I um could go by car, but apparently not. So we're going by plane. It's in Japan, mate. <laughs> yeah, always- Obviously, you can't go like our yeah, team's literally <laughs> sponsored by like is UAE Emirates, which is an airline <laughs> as well. Well, yeah, Wait, is, right. they're sponsored by the country, not the airline. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I think they're sponsored by okay. the country. Benji, uh, my geography is obviously maybe not as good as uh, I thought and maybe just as bad as Pikachu's. But today we had the TT. 
no big changes on GC at all. Van Aert running out the uh, big deserved winner. Dan- Denmark absolutely dominating, and we'll see you with the uh, the mean battle on Champs Elysees tomorrow. Maybe we can complain about whether it's a, a procession or not. I'm hoping I'm hoping Lucas Perselberger snags it from a breakaway attempt. <laughs> Come on, Lucas! Like the last. Oh, Come on, yeah. you can do it, man. Like if you had to name one rider. As a finisher of this podcast, just like the last rider to make that move in the last week alone, would it be Perslebeg or before? I think he'd like pretend he's doing it as a meme or a joke, but then actually, like, but actually, I'm because didn't he win a Giro stage or something in the same way? Yeah, yeah, Perslebeger, please. I wink at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be funny. All right, hopefully something like that happens and there's a bit of drama, but. You know, fingers crossed. We'll see you at the recap tomorrow. Ciao.